uh, King Solomon wrote this, and it was a song, and he wrote this. We believe it's inspired scripture, holy scripture from God, and it is, the book of Song of Solomon is about, really, the relationship between a husband and wife. Parts of it are when they're courting each other. And uh, then you can see in this chapter, these were married people. And what it does is it gives us an insight into how we should respond to our own spouse. So begin reading with me in uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. I went to my garden, dear friend, best lover. I want you to note the word friend. This is the man calling his wife his friend. We'll come back to that. Um, Breathed the sweet fragrance. I ate the fruit and honey. I drank the nectar and wine. Celebrate with me, my friends. Raise your glasses to life and to love. Once again, this is the man talking to his wife. Now, the woman responds. She said, I was sound asleep, but in my dreams, I was wide awake. Oh, listen, it is the sound of my lover knocking calling. And then the man responds, let me in, dear companion, dearest friend, my dove, consummate lover. I'm soaked with the dampness of the night, drenched with dew and shivering and cold. And then the woman responds, but I'm in my nightgown. I just think that's a hilarious thing to be in the Bible. Um, You know, the wife said, I'm in my nightgown. I can't do that. And maybe that is a biblical excuse, all right, uh, ladies, for stuff you don't want to do. But I'm in my nightgown, all right? Um, And she said, I'm in my nightgown. Do you expect me to get dressed? Well, the understanding was, yeah, kind of, you know. She said, I'm in my nightgown. Do you expect me to get dressed? I'm bathed and in bed. Do you want me to get dirty? But my lover wouldn't take no for an answer. And the longer he knocked, the more excited I became. I got up to open the door to my lover, sweetly ready to receive him, desiring and expectant. And as I turned the door handle, but when I opened the door, he was gone. My loved one had tired of waiting and left. I died inside. Oh, I felt so bad. I ran out looking for him, but he was nowhere to be found. I called into the darkness, but no answer. The night watchmen found me as they patrolled the streets of the city. And then it says, as we continue on, the the wife talking, they slapped me and beat me and bruised me. Once again, this is poetry. This is a song. This is telling a story of how husband and wife should treat each other. It said, they slapped and beat me and bruised me and ripped off my clothes. These watchmen who were supposed to be guarding the city, I beg you, sisters in Jerusalem, if you find my lover, please tell him I want him, that I am heartsick with love for him. And here's the chorus where the daughters of Jerusalem responded, what's so great about your lover, fair lady? What's so special about him that you beg for our help? And then the woman responds. Now, once again, understand that, yes, this is Holy Scripture, but God is describing in a very poetic way how we should feel about one another, how we should respond to one another. Husbands and wives are actually to love each other. Now, you may ask, well, what happens when the romance wears off? Well, you're gonna, I'm going to show you today how to stay connected and how you can, uh, it doesn't matter what the emotions are, when you follow uh, with action, the emotions will follow. So the woman responded. She said, my dear lover glows with health, red-blooded, radiant. He's one in a million. There's no one quite like him. My golden one, pure and untarnished, with raven black curls tumbling across his shoulders. His eyes are like doves, 
soft and bright. By the way, this is ancient poetry, okay? I'm assuming that some of this stuff would not be what you would describe as sexy today, all right? But she thought her husband was a stud. That's what she was saying, all right? She thought he was quite a man. He's the golden one, pure and untarnished, with raven black curls tumbling across his shoulder. Now, if you have raven black curls, good for you, all right? Um, I do not, all right? I've got gray hair, but uh, so, and I'm not going to let it grow to my shoulders, okay? Because my head is already big enough. If I let my hair grow out, I have hair that like grows out and then down. I don't know why. But she was describing him uh, with love. His eyes are like doves, soft and bright, but deep set, brimming with meaning like wells of water. His face is rugged. His beard smells like sage. That does not mean that you got macaroni and cheese in the beard, okay? That's not what he's saying. There's no leftover dinner in it, okay? But she's saying that he is delightful. He is someone that she loves, his voice, his words, warm and reassuring. Fine muscles ripple beneath his skin, quiet and beautiful. His torso is the work of a sculptor. Now, I got to say, as I look out across the crowd, I doubt there are many that have a great six-pack like this, okay? But it's okay. If you don't have a six-pack, have a keg, all right? That, that's all you need just that the wife responds, okay? It says uh, his, his torso is like the work of a sculptor, hard and smooth as ivory. His, he stands tall like a cedar, strong and deep-rooted, a rugged mountain of a man, aromatic with wood and stone. His words are kisses, his kisses words. Everything about him delights me, thrills me through and through. This is my lover, that's my man, dear Jerusalem sisters. Now, what we learn from this is that you can have a long, happy marriage by doing two things. Number one, you build your marriage around Jesus. That is critical. Now, does that mean that every Christian couple, every Christian marriage is never going to get a divorce? No, it does not. But the second thing you got to do, and this is critical, this is key, you got to become friends. And that doesn't mean that you have to do everything uh, exactly alike. You don't even have to do everything together. Uh, but there are some things you need to do. If you're going to build a marriage that lasts, you got to do three things. Number one, you got to work on your relationship. That's what these people were doing in this beautiful poem. They were working on their relationship. Were there days that they did not feel poetic? I'm sure there were. They were normal people. Once again, this was the way King Solomon felt about his wife and each other. They were in love, okay? And you might say, well, uh, I love her or I love him, but I don't feel like I'm in love any longer. And once again, that is a silly excuse because the truth is there are going to be days that you don't feel like you're in love. You're not going to feel like ladies describing your husband as having a marble, marble hard torso, all right? Uh, the, the longer you're married, the less marbly he might become, and that's okay. But the point is, the way that they spoke to each other, they worked on their relationship. Incredibly important. Uh, God doesn't say that desire and romance and emotions are unimportant. In fact, this entire book, Song of Solomon, is about that. And so God is not suggesting that you not have emotion and that you just live like a robot. But what he is saying is that you need to work on your relationship. Now, the husband described his wife uh, as beautiful. He described her eyes, her hair, her breasts, her lips, her breath, how her lips taste, how her tongue tastes. He described her thighs, her belly, and even her garden. Now, 
If you're wondering what a garden is, let me just say it's not a bean patch. All right, that's as far as I'll go. Uh, so, so they're describing each other. They are in love. They're willing to touch each other. They're willing to work on their relationship. They realize that touch is important. They realize that communication is important. They realize that the way they speak to one another is incredibly, incredibly important. Now, Jesus commands us to love our spouse. He also commanded us to love our neighbor and our enemies. Now, what does that mean? Well, emotions cannot be commanded, okay? So he's not talking about feelings. He's talking about actions. And this is the key to understanding how to stay connected. You don't depend on how you feel. Some days you're not going to feel in love. You're not going to feel like talking. You're not going to feel good. And that's okay. But commit to loving actions, even when you don't feel good. And when you do that, the emotions will follow. Here's the second thing. You got to work on your friendship. Work on your relationship, but work on your friendship. The man called his wife his dear friend. And in other translations, the wife also calls her husband her lover and her friend. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that friendship in marriage is very important. And, and, and I must say this. One of the things that I love about being married to Kim is that we really are good friends. I love to hang out with her. I love to do things with her, you know. And uh, we both work at the church, okay. And, uh, you know, if you work together, that can be a challenge at times, right? But I love to hang out with her. And that is the reason I believe that we, in 36 years of a marriage, we still love each other. We're still committed to each other. And I still like to be with her. I like to hang out with her. She still makes me laugh. And she amuses me sometimes with the questions that she asks. But we've worked on the friendship. Now, let, let me tell you a couple of things about friends. Friends talk to each other. If you're a friend with someone, you talk to them. And that means you got to learn how to talk to each other in your marriage. And we've already talked about communication, so I'm not going to uh, rehash that. But you can learn to talk to each other. Number two, friends spend time together. And I'm going to tell you that it is easy often, especially for men, to get so consumed with their work. Now, realize that sometimes we don't have control over our schedule with our work. I get that, okay? You can march into your boss and say, I'm not going to work as much, and you might get fired, and so I understand that. But you've got to learn to spend time together. Now, I'm going to go ahead and be bold and say this. You've got time. You just got to make sure that you're managing the time. We all have the same amount of time. I realize some people work more hours than others. But there are choices that you make on a daily basis about your time. You can spend time watching television on social media, on the internet, or piddling around the garage. It doesn't matter what it is. You can spend time doing that, and, or you can make a choice to spend time with your spouse. I'm not suggesting that you should never uh, have a hobby. There is, it's important to have some alone time, okay? But you got to learn to spend time together. And then number three, friends share common goals. What do I mean by that? Well, in 1 Peter 3, verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Now, what does that mean? He says, sympathize with each other. In other words, have sympathy toward each other about feelings and desires and so forth. And it says, love each other. Now, the word sympathize means common passion. You need to have a common passion. Now, does that mean that, husband, if you love to hunt and fish, that your wife has to go hunting and fishing with you? No, it does not. Now, if she wants to, that's great, okay? But 
uh, you know, I've never been a hunter or a fisherman, even though I grew up in the country and everybody in my family did. I don't know why. I just never got that interested. I went uh, with a friend one time to go hunting for raccoons. And um, I got to tell you, that was one of the worst experiences of my life. We left the house about 11 at night and a bunch of guys out there with their trucks, they let these dogs out, and they started talking about stuff that I had no clue what they were talking about. And I thought we were going to chase after the dogs to hunt a raccoon. And they're like, nope, we're going to stand here. And they threw their foot up on the bumper of the truck, and they told lies to each other until they heard the dog, oh, and they called it out. I don't know how they knew the dog's voice, and I put that in quotes. And they're like, oh, she treed one, or oh, he treed one. I didn't even know what that meant. And I said, what are we going to do now? They said, well, we're going to go find the raccoon. And so we followed the sound of the dogs, and we got around the raccoon, and then they grabbed the dogs, and they said, that's it. And I'm, I looked, I said, aren't you going to shoot the raccoon? They're, nope, we're leaving it there. Now it's time to go home. And I thought, this is the worst hunting experience ever. I mean, we did all of this, traipsed through the woods, and we didn't even get the kill, all right? Now, it doesn't mean that you have to like exactly the same things. You might like football, and she may not. But it means you've got to share common passion. And I'll tell you this, the way that you share something in common is not in the details of what you like to do. You may like to go hiking. He may not. You may like the beach. He may like the mountains. It doesn't mean you have to like everything exactly the same, but it means that at the highest level, you got to share the right goals and the right passion. And where that begins is a passion for Jesus Christ, living for God. And it shows how important it is that both husband and wife have this passion for living for God. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians that you shouldn't be married to an unbeliever if you're a Christian. Now, why is that? Well, because it's impossible for you to share a common passion. It is impossible for you to love Jesus in the same way. And so the friends talk to each other, they spend time together, and then they share common goals and common passions. And then friends navigate difficult times together. It says in Proverbs, a, f a friend is closer than a brother. A friend sticks through Good times and bad times. And what you've got to learn to do is commit to each other as friends in that way that even when things get difficult, you're going to stay in it. I'll be kind of open about my own marriage. We've been married 36 years, and I can't imagine that there's another person on this planet that would have uh, done more for me and pleased me more than my wife. She is just a wonderful, wonderful person. But there have been times because, you know, starting a church can be extremely stressful. I'm sure that many careers can be very stressful. But there were times that I literally about broke down emotionally and there were times that I got so angry and so upset and so pulled apart that, you know, I said some things to her that I didn't mean and I wish I'd never said. And um, the truth is, we made a commitment. And when we got married, we said we will not discuss divorce. And we never have. We've thought about murder, but not divorce. And the truth is that there are times when you carry heavy burdens. There was a time uh, that I was carrying a secret. Now, it wasn't anything that I had done, but someone that had had an affair, and I'd been sworn to secrecy, and I was praying through this, and I was dealing with this, and Kim noticed there was something going on with me emotionally, and she honestly thought that I was having an affair, and I was not. But my point is this. Friends stick through thick and thin. There are going to be times it's difficult. You know why? Because you're married to another fallen human being. 
You're married to a person who is not perfect. And just in the same way that Jesus commits to us, even when we're not perfect, we should stay committed to our spouse as friends, as lovers, as husband and wife, even when things are difficult. And so the Bible tells us we got to work on our relationship. We got to work on our friendship. And then finally, work on your companionship. There's a difference between being a friend and a companion. Listen to Song of Solomon 8, verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Do you get that? That's a permanent seal. It's not only a legal thing, but it's a permanent thing. Set me as a seal upon your arm. For love, notice what he says here, is as strong as death. Now, once again, the things we find romantic in our culture may not I doubt you're going to see that line in a romantic movie. Oh, I love you to death. <laughs> uh, I love you. Our love is as strong as death. And you know what that means? It just means it's permanent. When you really love a person and make that commitment, your love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire. You get this idea that it's from the Spirit of God, this love that we have for one another, the very flame of the Lord. Love is fiery. Sometimes it fires romantic passion. Sometimes it fires anger. Sometimes it fires frustration. But if you've made this commitment in the sight of God and to God and to each other, this idea about working on a companionship, you are in it for the long haul. Then he says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all of the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. In our culture today, we say things like, you can't buy me love. We write songs about it and sings, and I say we, I didn't write it, but, uh, you know, they write songs, and we listen to it, and we love that, because it really describes the same sentiment. Now, what is it? You got to work on your companionship, work on your friendship, Work on your relationship, and when you do that, you can stay committed for a lifetime. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help each of us to stay committed completely to each other. God, I pray that first of all, people would be committed to Jesus. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that is not committed to Jesus, that today would be the day that they begin that relationship with him. And I pray your blessing over all the marriages, all those that are going to be married, all of those that are contemplating divorce or breaking up. God, I pray that you just speak to them, move in their life. Now, before I finish my prayer, just keep your head bowed if you would. I want to say this. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to know that God loves you. In fact, he loved you so much, he sent Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, who was in eternity. He became human and lived a perfect life in your place. And he died for your sins, but that's not just what he did. He died to reconcile you to the Father. He died to make you whole, to make you complete. And so today, if you'd say, Pastor I don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, but I'd like to. How do I do that? Well, it's real simple. The Bible tells us, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, what does that mean? In prayer, you ask, God save me. Lord, you, I may not understand everything there is to understand about the Bible, but I believe Jesus died in my place and rose from the grave, so please save me. You say that prayer in your heart. Online, you say that prayer, and it is a prayer that God always promises to answer, yes, I'll do that. And so I encourage you today to pray that and receive Christ today. Online, please mark at the bottom 
that you prayed to receive Christ, and we can follow up with you in the room. Is there anyone that said, Pastor Richie, I prayed that prayer with you today to receive Jesus as my Savior and begin that relationship with him? With heads bowed, just raise your hand. Anybody like that, you'd say, I prayed that prayer uh, today. Uh, Just raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it, and I encourage you to fill out the card if you prayed that prayer today, and then you can drop it in a bucket or over by next steps on the way out. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 3, it takes wisdom to have a good family, and it takes understanding to make it strong. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make strong families, people that are committed to you and to each other. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. We're getting ready to have our uh, vow renewal ceremony. But before we do, understand this. In our culture today, one in two marriages ends in divorce. That doesn't even include the people that live together and never get married and split apart. But one in two marriages ends in divorce. However, for families who actually attend church together, commit their life to Christ, and pray and read the Bible as a family. Would you like to know the statistic? It is one out of 1,105 that end a divorce. Now, the truth is, it does not take a brain surgeon to figure out which one is better. Okay? And so, as we make this commitment, as we renew these vows together, I hope that you'll understand that you're going to commit not only to each other, but to Jesus in your marriage. Now, I'm going to ask uh, all those that signed up to be a part of the vow renewal uh, to come forward. And we're going to make kind of a semicircle here. You just face each other, just make a line. If you did not sign up, but you'd like to participate, you say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make those vows, uh, then you come as well. Okay, go ahead and start coming. Go ahead and start coming. Um, It's okay. And you just kind of make a a, a little arc here, semicircle. And let me say this. If you are not married, but you've made the commitment to each other, you're committed to each other, and you want to be married today, you can join us as well. All right? Bring me your marriage um, license and... uh, I'll sign it. And so, everybody can just come on up. You can make some room. Y'all just kind of, you're looking beautiful, nice, nice semicircle. Let's make some room for uh, Larry and his wife here, okay? So, every one of these couples has come today to renew their vows. And um, in doing this, you're making a public statement that you love your spouse, And so, I'm going to ask each of you, if you will, to turn and face each other, all right? Uh, Just turn and face each other, and you guys can come on in. You can spread out a little bit, let them in here. Uh, Just turn and face each other, and um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to make our vows. Now, we're going to do it all together. I'm not calling out everybody individually to do this, all right? So, when I say husbands and I tell you what to say, then you say that, okay? And then when I say wives and tell you what to say, then you say that, okay? Lord, I pray over these marriages, these homes that are represented here today. God, I pray that you bless them in a mighty way. God, thank you for everyone that's here today that's going to commit their love, recommit to each other. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you pour your favor out on them In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, we're going to start with the husbands. So husbands, get ready. When I say a phrase, you just repeat it, but you don't repeat it to me. You repeat it to your spouse, okay? All right, husbands, ready? I take you to be my wedded wife. I am recommitting my love to you. To have and hold... From this day forward, for richer, for poorer, hopefully for richer, for better, for worse, 
to cleave unto you and to you only as long as we both shall live. I choose you, and with loyal love I thee endow. I give my heart to you again. All my worldly goods I share with you. And you probably got more worldly goods now than you did when you first got married, so be honest, all right? So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, now, wives, it's your turn. So, say to your husband, I take you to be my wedded husband. I am recommitting my love to you. To have and hold from this day forward, for richer or poorer, for better or worse, to cleave unto you and to you only, as long as we both shall live. I choose you, and with loyal love I thee endow. I give my heart to you again. All my worldly goods I share with you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, everybody, just turn and face me if you would. Because of the promises you just made to each other before God and these witnesses, and by virtue of the authority vested in me as a minister of the gospel and the laws of this state, I now pronounce that you are husband and wife, recommitted to loving each other in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And we can give them a hand. And now, for the fun part, you may kiss the bride. Now we're going to celebrate. Now we're going to celebrate. Now, for those of you that signed up before, so we got the certificate prepared for you, you can pick that up and the book that I signed and wrote a little message to each of you. Um, you can pick that up over here um, after the service. You don't have to do it now. You can go to the reception first. But here's what we're going to do. And this is going to be fun. We're going to have some wedding cake. And we're going to have some food. And we're going to have some music. And if you're lucky, we'll even have a dance. All right? In, uh, in just a little bit. And anybody can participate. All right? And uh, so uh, if you're like me, I have, uh, I have two left feet. So, uh, and that's okay. But we're going to have the food, and uh, we had so many wonderful volunteers that made this beautiful reception. Let's give them a hand. They did a great job. But you can hang out. You can have food. You can have punch. Uh, and then we'll let you know if we've got a nice song uh, that you'd like to dance to, then you can come out and dance as well. All right? Lord, thank you for this food. We pray that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to let the couples that renewed get in line first, but everybody's invited, and you can eat and hang out as long as the food lasts. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.